Welcome to Clarifying Catholicism's Science of Catholic Teaching. In this series, we examine the Church's teachings on marriage and sexuality from a scientific perspective. Most of the studies cited in this series were compiled in Father Robert Spitzer's The Moral Wisdom of the Catholic Church, a defense of her controversial moral teachings, and they can be found in the description. Without further ado, on to the show. Here at Clarifying Catholicism, we enjoy, well, clarifying Catholicism. And that is why, before we delve into this episode's rather sensitive topic, I need to state quite firmly that the Catholic Church does not claim that same-sex attraction is a sin. We do not condemn people with same-sex attraction to hell. We do not advocate for unjust treatment or discrimination against people with same-sex attraction. In fact, the Catechism of the Catholic Church says, homosexuals must be accepted with respect, compassion, and sensitivity. Every sign of unjust discrimination in their regard should be avoided. As I mentioned last episode, I know a lot of young conservative Catholics who obsess over sexual ethics. They do so at their own detriment and that of others often. What I mean by that is some people hyper-focus on sexuality so much that they neglect other aspects of their lives. These same people often speak about these issues so voraciously that they, regardless of intention, come across as rude, judgmental, and holier than thou. Trust me, I've admittedly been one of these people in the past. I have one more disclaimer before we get started. Given the sensitivity of LGBT issues, as well as their recency, it is immensely difficult to get a lot of accurate and large-scale data about the topic. I've known very good, skilled researchers in psychology, social science, and other fields who will not touch anything remotely close to LGBT issues with a 10-foot pole. And that's because they fear retaliation from their employers and the media if they publish any data that could suggest that there are indeed concerning behaviors that are associated with leading a gay lifestyle. This is a key reason why I'm so skeptical of academia. It's because I've met so many honest, hardworking professors and researchers who are incredible at conducting and analyzing data, and I've seen them dragged through the mud because they're just doing their job. It is a death wish to study same-sex attraction today, especially if your findings cast skepticism on gay lifestyles. With all that out of the way, let us review the purpose of sex according to Father Spitzer. Sex fulfills four levels of happiness, materialistic pleasure, and ego comparative, which are the two immature levels, and contributive empathetic and transcendent faith-based, which are the two mature levels. Regarding materialistic pleasure, sex pleases us, it feels good. Regarding ego comparative, sex makes us feel strong and captivating the attention of another person. For contributive empathetic, sex is a self-gift to another person. It not only contributes to their well-being, but that contribution is ultimately manifest in the creation of a child, which is unique to male-female relationships. Finally, transcendent faith-based means that this selfless gift, in the sustenance of a relationship and the creation of a new life, mirrors God's creativity. It is only by joining yourself to a member of the opposite sex that you can create new life because God built us to be incomplete without each other. When the possibility for having kids is removed from this equation, whether that be because of birth control, same-sex intercourse, or impotence, not to be confused with infertility, it removes the climax of the third level of happiness. And yes, the Catholic Church does not allow impotent people to marry. If you lack the capacity to have sex that can lead to a child, you cannot get married. Obviously, friendships can be contributive and spiritually fulfilling but this series focuses on how sex can contribute to those levels of happiness. Sex, by nature, is creative, and once that creative aspect is removed, it becomes easy to fall into using sex for primal pleasure and utility. Furthermore, it is simply impossible for same-sex couples to reach the same level of creativity that heterosexual couples can, given their inability to, well, procreate. 
Remember, procreation brings a unique kind of creativity, a fundamentally different type of chemical release that no other action can replicate. This essential quality of heterosexual intercourse is what justifies a special sacramental distinction, which is marriage. So, same-sex intercourse is in a totally different ballpark than its heterosexual counterpart. But can it still achieve some semblance of the higher levels of happiness? Sure, but what are the odds of this happening? What does data have to say about happiness and same-sex attraction? Perhaps it is good to begin with the origins of same-sex attraction. This topic continues to be debated today, but so far there is little evidence that same-sex attraction is genetic. In 2019, the Scientific American published a study that estimated genetics could account for between 8 to 25 percent of the behavior of people with same-sex experience. The rest of their behavior was likely environmental. Furthermore, there is an alarming trend of children who experienced sexual abuse who later came out as gay or bisexual. Obviously, this isn't to say that abuse always causes same-sex attraction, but it's fairly well documented that a notable percent of the gay community suffers from childhood trauma. Speaking of mental health, Richard Fitzgibbons, writing in National Catholic Bioethics Quarterly, cites a few alarming statistics. Homosexual men have three times more major depression than heterosexual men. Lesbian women have double the rate of heterosexual women. Homosexual men report a five times greater incidence of panic disorder compared to heterosexual men. Homosexual men have three and a half times more drug dependence than their heterosexual counterparts. And lesbian women have four times the drug dependence than heterosexual women. But will, you say? Isn't that just because of discrimination against homosexual persons? If we just tolerate and accept their behaviors, won't those mental health disorders go away? Well, there's little evidence to suggest that that would happen on a significant scale. Countries like the Netherlands and New Zealand have reached near-universal acceptance of same-sex attraction, yet look at the former's numbers. In the Netherlands, despite the near-universal acceptance of same-sex lifestyles, 26.8% of homosexual men have been reported as having a death wish. That's astonishing compared to 5.8% of heterosexuals. Suicide contemplation is at a staggering 40.2% compared to 7.8% of heterosexual men. Reports of deliberate self-harm are at 14.6% among homosexual men compared to just 2% of heterosexual men. 10.7% of bisexual men and 10.5% of homosexual men report having used illicit substances such as cocaine and methamphetamine, which is nearly double the amount straight men report using. Even here in America, my personal generational experience, for what it's worth, has been that if you come out as gay, you're celebrated. It's a mark of pride, and many companies intentionally hire people who identify as gay or give them better pay. I've seen this a lot. And I anticipate many studies will come out in the future to validate this experience. If anything, the group I've seen stigmatized by the media, corporate America, and Hollywood isn't related to the LGBT communities, which they celebrate, Hollywood, the media, and corporate America target Christians today. The idea here is that things like bullying and discrimination aren't the primary drivers of mental health disorders among people with same-sex attraction. Instead, it may be worth exploring if same-sex attraction might be a manifestation of prior traumas or mental health issues. Most people I know who identify as gay were severely bullied as children, and not necessarily because of anything to do with sexuality. Spitzer's point is that the natural desire for procreation cannot be fulfilled by actions that simply cannot accomplish that task. That intimacy, that chemical release of creating new life is absent in same-sex intercourse, and that is what may cause long-term depression and anxiety. You're trying to fit a round peg into a square hole by trying to fill the void of level three and four happiness, which is most optimally satisfied by conceiving a child with sex that cannot possibly do that. One of the largest studies on this issue is by Stephen Russell and Jessica Fish, in which the latter asks, 
Today's lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender youth come out at younger ages, and public support for LGBT issues has dramatically increased. So why do LGBT youth continue to be at higher risk for compromised mental health? Additionally, in this series, we've very thoroughly explored how multiple sexual partners increases the likelihood of divorce, as well as mental health issues. For straight people, things like contraception remove the unitive, procreative, and committal aspects of sex, which opens the door to casual sex. For the gay community, there isn't any procreative or biologically committal aspect of sex, which flings the door wide open for promiscuity. Roughly 73% of straight men reported one sexual partner in the last year, compared to 47% of bisexual men and 37% of gay men. 9% of straight men reported two sexual partners in the last year, compared to 16% of bisexual men and 17% of gay men. 10% of straight men reported three or more sexual partners, whereas 25% of bisexual men and 36% of gay men reported the same. As I mentioned last episode, 21% of heterosexual men and 19% of heterosexual women report being unfaithful to their spouses. This shoots up to 48% of homosexual men and 52% of homosexual women. Furthermore, I mentioned last episode how contraception doesn't protect against STDs. Well, the same applies to people practicing same-sex intercourse. In 2014, gay and bisexual men accounted for 83% of new syphilis cases. AIDS is quite prevalent among men who have sex with other men because it is easily transmitted via anal sex. That kind of sex, by the way, is way riskier than ordinary sex, even for men having it with women. So, considering its popularity among people with same-sex attraction, they are far more at risk to participate in it and spread STDs. Look, I'm trying to hammer in the point that sexuality cannot, or at least should not, be divorced from procreation. Once you remove procreation, we risk degrading sex into an egocentric pleasure fest. There's something beautiful, almost magical, about the realization that what you are doing is participating in procreative action. That is something that same-sex intercourse cannot do. Look, the point of this episode isn't to say that people with same-sex attraction should be demonized, hated, or unjustly treated. Rather, the point is that awareness needs to be raised of the health risks, both psychologically and biologically, that are associated with homosexual and bisexual lifestyles. There are people born with same-sex attraction who live holy and healthy lives. If we love them, then we ought to help them, not by forcing them to do anything but by providing resources and information that they can willingly choose to accept or reject. Finally, I need to restate that the moral issues the church takes up with people with same-sex attraction are the same issues it has with things like birth control and pornography. When sex is isolated from its procreative nature, people tend to suffer, regardless of gender or attraction. Speaking of which, next episode we will look more closely at pornography's effects on society. Until then, have a great day. God bless you.